All right, we're here to talk about a third and final for this week problem for utilitarianism. Uh, what we're gonna do today, the pro we'll discuss a little bit about the nature of the problem. I'll go into a little bit more depth. Then in summarizing the problem, we're gonna pull out uh, a selection from the Schaefer Landau text and actually gonna practice some of our skills of summarizing an argument in valid premise conclusion form. So I'm gonna do that in front of you all sometime uh, for, for part of this time. And in the course of summarizing the argument, we'll get a little practice with that skill. And it'll also be an occasion for me to show you the value of that skill because what we're then gonna do is talk about the way that utilitarians can reply to the objection by rejecting one or the other of these premises or doing something else altogether. So we'll talk about the problem. We'll spend some time getting it in a valid argument from the Schaefer Landau text. And then finally, we'll talk about how utilitarians can reply to the problem. This was in the context towards the end of the movie. It's not really a spoiler, but uh, towards the end of the movie where Batman is trying to hunt down Joker, a villain who's terrorizing Gotham. Uh, you can't find him. And so he decides to use this technology that Lucius created. That's Morgan Freeman's character. Um, to turn everyone's cell phone without their consent or even their knowledge into, um, I don't know how to get into the science of it. I don't understand it. Basically, I think of it as like an echolocator um, where it, he's accessing the microphone of every cell phone and maybe other parts of the cell phone to hear what's happening around the cell phone so he can hear Joker and then somehow, uh, in a way I don't understand, using it to actually see what's happening around that cell phone. So he'll be able to hear Joker wherever he is, or if he's near a cell phone, which of course he's gonna be because cell phones are ubiquitous now. Uh, and then he'll be able to pinpoint his location and maybe even see some sort of image of him. Anyway, so that's gonna allow him to catch him and save who knows how many people in Gotham. All right, so the dilemma is clear. If he uses it, he's able to save hundreds, thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of lives. Who knows how many people Joker would have killed if he wasn't caught. Um, he's already killed a lot. So he's able to save tons of lives if he uses it. Without using it, he can't find him. That's the only reason he's using it. On the other hand, he is violating uh, millions of people's rights to privacy. We generally think that we have a right to privacy of some kind. We generally tend to think that we, this includes uh, our cell phones, the, at least the use of the microphones on our cell phones. Uh, it would be, it would constitute a violation of our privacy, of our right to privacy if someone was using, uh, somehow hacked into and used the video or audio feed of our cell phone. Interestingly, there is some nefarious court case history behind this sort of thing. Um, there was a court case back in the 70s that all told, there was some back and forth and it went to higher courts and higher courts, but the end result was uh, the decision that essentially the phone companies own your records, you don't. And so phone companies can hand over your records to anyone they please without your consent. So, uh, and they routinely do hand those over to governmental agencies. Uh, kind of worrisome regardless. So it might not be that legally speaking, we have a right to that sort of thing. But uh, I think part of the reason it's worrisome is because we do, do think that, you know, we should have that right legally speaking. We do have that right morally speaking, right? So um, the problem here is that in order to save all of these lives, Batman has to violate people's rights. That's the problem. And the problem for utilitarianism is that utilitarianism seems to require us to routinely violate people's rights in this way whenever it's going to create for the uh, create the highest amount of net happiness, which in this case it does. So in this case, not only should Batman do it, but it's obvious that he should do it because he's saving however many lives over just violating someone's right. And if they never know about it, in fact, it should be really obvious as a decision because if they never know about it, which there's no reason to expect they would, uh, he's creating tons of happiness by using it and no unhappiness. Their lives are exactly the same in, to their experience than if he had never used it, right? They never know. Maybe it creates a little bit of unhappiness in Lucius because he's the one who knows. Maybe a little bit of unhappiness in Batman that he has to use it. But compared to that happiness of thousands, hundreds of thousands of lives saved, that's nothing. 
So utilitarians are committed to committing uh, deep injustices, violations of rights, pretty consistently and whenever it maximizes net happiness. That's the problem. Okay, so let's move on to making it a little bit more precise and getting into a little bit of our practice with our logic tools. So here's Schaefer Landau's statement of this. Perhaps the greatest problem for utilitarianism can be simply put, we must maximize well-being. I'm calling that happiness here. But sometimes we can do this only by committing some serious injustice. Moral theories should not permit, much less require, that we act unjustly. unjustly. Therefore, there's something deeply wrong about utilitarianism. Now, this is already, Schaefer Landau, you know, is a big proponent of putting things in clear logical form. So this is already almost there. So we might try initially using the actual sentences as premises and conclusion. The lesson of this is going to be we probably shouldn't do that. It's better to be willing to paraphrase, but it usually is, a temptation is to use the actual sentences that the author uses. It's often better in order to get uniformity of language because we don't often talk in pure logical form uh, to be willing to paraphrase that author. But let's just try it without doing that. Here's what it would look like. We know that the conclusion is that there's something deeply wrong about utilitarianism. How do we know that? Well, there's this therefore, that's good clue. Uh, we know it's not really a consistently good clue that it comes at the end of the paragraph. In this case it does, but that probably shouldn't be a good indicator. The therefore is a pretty good indicator, but there's also clues just in the structure of the argument, right? To claim that there's something deeply wrong about utilitarianism isn't evidence that moral theory should not permit that we act unjustly. It seems to be the opposite, right? these things, these two things are supporting this. And the only way you can get that, you know, the easy things are the little grammatical clues, right? The words used, the little indicators, and the, those won't always be there. The harder thing to do is look at the argument and kind of see what supports what, right? Uh, what is evidence of what, right? If without, you could figure out that this last sentence is the conclusion, even if there wasn't a therefore there, because it's not the kind of thing the content of it is not the type of content that could support either of the other two claims. And yet those other two claims are the kind of thing that could support this last claim. So that's where we get the order. If you do this, you're still, you're already doing really well. Okay, perhaps the greatest problem for utilitarianism can be simply put, we must maximize well-being, but sometimes we can do this only by committing some serious injustice. Moral theory should not permit, much less require, that we act unjustly. Therefore, there's something deeply wrong about utilitarianism. This is all right. If you did this on a paper, you'd get most of the credit. But what we want to do is not only simplify these sentences down, but we also want to use consistent language across these sentences. Uh, for example, look here. The greatest problem, it's called the greatest problem for utilitarianism in the first but then the conclusion is about something deeply wrong. But those are supposed to be referring to the same kind of thing, something problematic, something wrong. Normal people know that those are referring to the same kind of thing, but what we wanna do just to kind of beat a dead horse here is make that language exactly the same. So we wanna use the greatest problem language or the something deeply wrong language or something else entirely, but it needs to be consistent across the premises for this to technically be valid. And the importance of that it's not just for fulfilling this definition of validity. Uh, it's important because there's often vaguenesses or connotations with certain phrases, right? You, there's at least room to question whether something can be the greatest problem for utilitarianism without being deeply wrong, right? I can imagine lots of scenarios in which the greatest problem for a theory does not make something deeply wrong about that theory because the theory might not have big problems at all. So one very small problem could still be the greatest problem and it wouldn't entail that there's something deeply wrong about that theory. And so technically speaking, it's not a valid argument because just knowing that there's a great problem doesn't entail that there's something deeply wrong. So that's all just to say there's a reason behind the rules here and staying consistent with your language is one of those rules and there's a reason behind that because sometimes using different language undermines the validity of the argument. You can't 
you can't reliably infer one thing from the other in some cases. That's just one example. Can we simplify the language to make it clearer? Can we change the language so that the logical structure is clear? And what I mean there essentially is following one of the logical forms that I gave you all in the handout. Um, because there's some turns of phrase here which can kind of be jumbling or misleading. So let me jump to the chase here. Here's what, here's what I'm gonna do to modify this argument. I'm going to make it follow the if A then B, A therefore B pattern, the modus ponens pattern. So what I'm gonna do is modify the per first premise to say if utilitarianism is true, then we are sometimes required to commit serious injustice, injustices. So what have I done? Well, I've taken this phrase out completely and that's because that's unnecessary. It's almost like an intermediary step. He's saying, well, if utilitarianism is true, we must maximize well-being. And if we must maximize well-being, then we have to sometimes commit serious injustices. But all that does is it gives you if A, then B, if B, then C, and that gives you if A, then C. So we can shorten that down since we know we can reliably make that inference because of transitivity of conditionals. Uh, I'm using fancy words here that we haven't talked about, but we know that if A then B and if B then C, then we can conclude if A then C. So I'm cutting out the middleman, so to speak here. I'm just saying if utilitarianism is true, then we're sometimes required to commit serious injustices. Now I could keep this language here, but again, uh, I want it to be consistent, right? I want it to match the language of the first premise. So if I really want, sorry, I'm not doing modus ponens here. I said I was earlier. I said, I'm not doing if A then B, A therefore B, I'm doing modus tollens. So if A then B, not B, therefore not A. And that's a valid argument form if you look at the valid argument form sheet that I've uploaded to Blackboard. So we're not sometimes required to commit serious injustices. That's really different from saying moral theories should not permit, much less require that we act unjustly. Because my claim doesn't have anything to do with moral theories. Um, but the essence of this claim is here. So what premise two, he's, what the original language was saying was that, look, why should moral theories not permit that we act unjustly? Because we shouldn't, we don't, we aren't sometimes required to act unjustly. That's why the moral theories shouldn't permit it. So these are really closely related claims and I'm changing it to perfectly match the language here so that we can have perfect validity. And so the conclusion is utilitarianism is false. And again, that's just matching the language here. And again, because I wanted to be consistent and actually get validity, I didn't want to go from the greatest problem to there's something deeply wrong with, I want to stay consistent. And I chose not to use either greatest problem language or deeply wrong language. I want to see whether the theory is true or false. That's what's really important here. That's what we're trying to determine is, is utilitarianism is true. So I'm reading a little bit into Schaefer Landau's argument here. I'm paraphrasing, but I don't think it's an unjust or uncharitable paraphrase. I think this is ultimately what he's getting at. He's saying we shouldn't accept utilitarianism. It's false. Now, all that to say, if you wanted to do this differently, you could. You could have your conditional say, um, if we should believe utilitarianism, then we should believe that sometimes we're required to commit serious injustices. We shouldn't believe that we're sometimes required to commit serious injustices, so we shouldn't believe utilitarianism. And again, that's also getting at the heart of his message, right? There's lots of different ways of paraphrasing this accurately. But this is how I've done it. I've done it to simplify and look how much simpler this is than this. This is complicated. It's got lots of dependent clauses. If you remember that from English, it's not totally clear how it all works. But when you put it all together like this, it's a very simple first conditional denial of the consequent and then so denial of the antecedent. Again, fancy terms for um, denying uh, that something actually, sorry, denying that something that follows from a theory is true and therefore denying the theory. Okay, so this is what I've come up with in terms of a valid construal of the argument. I think it's accurate to the argument. And the claim here is, so let's stop talking about the tools, the logical tools, and let's start talking about the argument. Uh, the first claim is if utilitarianism is true, sometimes re required to commit serious injustices. That's just what I was arguing about the Batman case. If utilitarianism is true, then Batman is required to use the cell phone machine. If utilitarianism is true, um, 
<clears throat> you could be re required to torture someone, <clears throat> even if they're innocent. If you think that torturing them is going to maximize net happiness, and that could be true. Suppose there's a terrorist who's going to detonate a bomb in the middle of a huge urban center, and you have no time to call the cops in or to do whatever, and all he wants you to do is torture someone, right? Now, if utilitarianism is true, the choice is clear. You should just torture that person. You're violating their right, uh, but you should do it. You should obviously do it because you're going to save millions of lives. And we could come up with issue or example after example after example like this. But the idea is surely we're not required to commit those serious injustices. We shouldn't be required in every case to commit that injustice, to violate that right. Okay, so we've been talking about cases where it's actually a hard decision. It would actually be a hard decision to make Batman's decision. It would be a hard decision to decide whether to torture the person in the terrorist case. Um, and so you could imagine the utilitarian saying, well, what, what's wrong with that? Surely, surely we should do that. And we'll talk about that as a response to this problem, but let's talk about the problem first. Uh, so conclusion is that since we're not committed, required to commit serious injustices, utilitarianism is false. And now what this enables to do, us to do, once we've summarized the argument in valid premise conclusion form, because it's valid, we know that if the premises are true, we have to accept the conclusion. That's what validity means. If the premises are true, the conclusion is true. So now if you're a utilitarian, you've got to tell me which premise is false. And having it in this form allows us to uh, distinguish which part of the argument is problematic if you're a utilitarian. Okay, so let's talk about, uh, I think I'm actually gonna skip the next slide, the next two. So one way of them objecting to the argument is just to deny premise one, to say, no, even if utilitarianism is true, it's not going to require us to commit serious injustice, injustices. So I think a elementary, a wrong-headed way of going about this, it's not gonna succeed for them, is to say that injustice will just never maximize net happiness. The problem with that is just that it obviously sometimes does, right? In the Batman case it does, in the terrorist case it does, and maybe in some cases that I could describe, you'll be able to say, well, in this case, you had an alternative, you could have, you know, there was an hour and you could have called in the bomb squad or whatever, uh, but, that's not going to be true with every single case, right? There are going to be some cases where violating someone's right or committing a grave injustice is going to be the thing that maximizes net happiness. So that's, I don't think that's a way of, a good way of denying premise one. Uh, and I don't think for that reason that, well, we'll talk about a, another way of denying premise one by modifying utilitarianism after we talk about the option of denying premise two. A more popular route is just to deny premise two. To say, well, no, sometimes we are required to commit serious injustices. So Batman should use the machine. You should torture the innocent person to save whatever, the city of Houston. Um, and so they just accept the counterintuitive result. Yeah, sometimes we're required to commit serious injustices, but it's for the greater good. And you know, that's my theory. I think you should do the thing that maximizes net happiness. And sometimes that requires doing something kind of icky. And you might even wax poetic here and say, yeah, um, and it's really the person who's willing to do the icky stuff that's a better person. You know, you wanna keep your hands clean? Well, you're not gonna be a good person, right? Uh, you don't wanna do anything that makes you look bad? Well, you're not gonna save cities full of millions of people then. Okay, so, um, this is a response, but it seems to, it's, it's easier, like I said earlier, it's easier to make that response about cases like the Batman case and cases like the terrorist case, where you're going to save millions um, by doing this thing, or the, the balance, uh, you know, if you violate the right, you're going to cause so much more happiness than if you don't. But there are lots of other cases where it's just not as clear. It's much harder to accept this counterintuitive result. And here's one, this case is called Chop Up Chuck. 
if you happen to be in charge of some clinic or emergency room or whatever medical facility of some kind, and you have, let's say five people who all require different organs in order to survive, they're all going to die really soon if they don't get that transplant. And none of them is high enough on the list to legally get a transplant. And they can't even illegally get one because, you know, the black market moves slowly too. There's no way other than one option to, for any of them to survive. And that option is, well, a homeless dude just walked into your clinic. He's a drifter. He has no family you discover. He has no friends. He has no connections. Um, you discover by talking to him, investigating him even maybe, that you can be very certain that no one is going to find out if he's dead. And you can see where this is going. Because let's say that the organs that each of these five people need just happen to be matches with him. He's a match, whatever you need. I, again, not a doctor. Well, I am a doctor, not a medical doctor. Um, don't have knowledge of this, but just kind of, if you're a nurse and you're like grinding your teeth at me right now, just assume for the sake of argument, we could, let me just say, we could come up with an example where something like this is true. Even if it's not five people, maybe it has to be three or whatever. And however unlikely it is, if it's possible, it could happen. And he's a match. His organs could save all five of these people, but he doesn't want to die. So what do you do? Well, if you're a utilitarian, the choice is clear. You kill him. You harvest his organs without his consent, and you save five lives at the expense of one. That's going to create more happiness than um, letting him live, because that means five people die because there's no other option for them to get those organs. And so if the utilitarian is gonna accept this counterintuitive, counterintuitive result that we, can, we have to commit serious injustice, injustices sometimes, they're gonna have to accept even these crazy, crazy, I take this to be a much more counterintuitive case than the Batman case or the terrorist case, where I wouldn't think that someone was crazy unreasonable for thinking that they should violate the rights in those cases. In this case, you're a lunatic or a sociopath or something. If you think you should kill this guy, but utilitarians seem to have to say that you should kill him. You morally ought to. In fact, if you don't, you're doing the wrong thing. Not only is it permissible to kill him, but you're doing the wrong thing. If you don't, it's obligatory that you kill him. Okay. So, um, I don't think this reply is going to work either. I don't think there's a real good way out. I'll, I'll, a spoiler alert. I don't think there's a real good way out for the utilitarian out of this problem of injustice. I said, I don't think their reply denying premise one would work. And now we've seen denying premise two is going to be hard too. So there's this third option of modifying the theory. Remember, we started from consequentialism. Utilitarianism is a form of consequentialism that says the good is happiness. You could deny utilitarianism and just take up a different form of consequentialism. Now, this is just to accept that this argument works against utilitarianism. So it's not to deny a premise, but it's to say, if we modify the theory and, and accept a different form of consequentialism, you couldn't come up with a similar problem. So goes the theory or so goes the response. So what we can do is say, we're gonna accept consequentialism, but we're not gonna accept that the good is happiness alone. We're going to accept that there are two things that are intrinsically good, justice and happiness. And this will allow us to say what got us into the problem with injustice was utilitarianism does not give justice any value on its own. Happiness is all that matters. So when happiness is pitted against justice, you have to pick happiness. So why don't we modify the theory, accept a different form of consequentialism that says, well, happiness and just justice are both good. Okay. That could work. And then if you're Batman, you could say, well, I think happiness is intrinsically good and justice is also. So now we have to weigh these things against each other. And in the chop up Chuck case, you could say, well, yeah, it would produce the most happiness to top, chop up Chuck, but it wouldn't produce the most justice. So now we have to weigh these things. Okay, so we're, we're pretty into the weeds here in terms of the details of these responses. This is the, probably the most nuanced response. So if you're kind of getting your head spun a little bit, that's normal. Uh, and I'd say, try to follow it. This is an interesting response. It's more important that you understand the higher level stuff, like the problem of injustice itself, and maybe those first two 
responses to it. But the pro there's a problem even with this response because now there are two intrinsic goods, happiness and justice. And now, like I was just alluding to, we have to know how to weigh them against each other, right? So are they equally valuable? Or does one take precedence over the other? And I list two options here, but there's really three and I'll talk about that. You might say that justice takes priority over happiness. But if you say that, then it seems like you've gotten really far from utilitarianism because utilitarianism was all about maximizing happiness because happiness is so good. But now you're saying justice will always take priority over happiness. And now you seem really far from the original intent of utilitarianism. It's a, it's a, it's a theory and it would allow you to say that you shouldn't chop up Chuck, that Batman shouldn't use the machine, that um, you shouldn't torture the innocent person if you wanted to say those things because justice is more important than happiness. So even though doing those things would create more happiness, they're unjust and so um, justice takes priority. But even that you might be uncomfortable with because you might be thinking, well, sometimes happiness takes priority over justice, right? Isn't there a case to be made that you should commit the torture to save the city of Houston, for example? Uh, isn't there a case to be made that Batman should use the machine? There's not a case to be made that you should chop up Chuck, sorry. But so if justice takes priority, full priority over happiness, you don't get to say those things though. On the other hand, maybe happiness takes priority over justice, but now we have the problem all over again because that's what caused the problem. Now we say, uh, well, if happiness takes priority over justice, then you should chop up Chuck. Because yeah, you're violating his rights, it's unjust, but it doesn't matter because you're creating the most happiness in doing so. The third option that I don't have listed here is saying they're equally valuable, but even that gets us into trouble because now we have no way of deciding a case where justice conflicts with happiness, especially if we can't quantify, even if we could quantify happiness and justice, how do we relate those quantities to each other? It's like relating pounds and uh, square inches or something like that, you know? It's, it's two different, completely different units of measurement. So all that to say, I'm not gonna get too much, I'm not gonna go any further into the weeds on this more, obviously more nuanced reply. I think there are problems with it, but let's just recap because we really got into the weeds on this objection in particular. Um, if you followed all of that, and you were just nodding along, that's awesome. If you didn't, uh, hopefully you got lost later rather than earlier. But even if you did get lost, the important point, uh, important points came early. And that's the understanding of the problem of injustice. Let's get back up here. That if you, here's, here's the important point to, to remember that there's this big objection to utilitarianism that it seems to require us to commit serious injustices and we shouldn't be required. We are not required to commit serious injustices. We are not required to chop up Chuck, for example. Utilitarianism seems to entail that we should chop up Chuck. In fact, we're bad, we're morally, we've done something wrong if we don't. And that is just too much. Utilitarianism has to be false. That's the big view. Talked about some replies so that the utilitarian can make their fraught with difficulty. Uh, this is a big problem for utilitarianism. But uh, that is the end of this video and I will stop there.